And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Bench with Bubba, episode 666. We're here to recap your week four of the fab world, talk about some recent news, some of it, because there's way too much to talk about on this one show today, and much, much more. In order to help me do this, as a friend of the show, he helps me off and on with another goofball that joins once in a while throughout the season to recap fab. This guy's the uh, the more you know straight-laced one out of the group here, and, and, and keeps the conversation going between two people. Um, you can find him, his work over at Sports Ethos this year, Sports Ethos this year. And he's on Twitter at Breaking Ben underscore T. Ben Tid, how you doing, my friend? Hey, Bubba. I always love that intro. It's, <laughs> it's always fun. I say about Curlin next. <laughs> yeah, I try, I, try, I try to keep the show grounded, I guess. Uh, he takes it off the, off the rails. But uh, thanks again for having me on. It's always fun. <laughs> always, always, my friend. It's great to have you. Um, well, uh, before we get into this and talk, like I, I mentioned at the top, people, there's a ton of news. If you really want everything, Follow my Substack. I put an article out every night slash morning or listen to the First Pitch Podcast. I'll have you all covered there for all of it. We're going to highlight the big stuff on this show. But before we get to that, Ben, let everybody know what you got going on at Sport Ethos, which we'll hit on later on in the show. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm doing a weekly article now um, at Sports Ethos. It's a uh, NFB centric. So I'm covering low rostered uh, starting pitchers in the NFBC main event. And I'm recommending uh, – the plan is to recommend four each week for streaming and, uh, like, short-term ads. So that's it for right now. Sweet. Yeah, no, looking forward to uh, checking all that cool stuff out. But before we do that, let's talk about the bad stuff. Let's talk about some news. First, we'll start with Bobby Miller, who has an elbow slash shoulder slash he's just messed up. It, everywhere I was looking, it changed throughout the day yesterday. But um, the, the latest I saw when you're looking at uh, Bobby Miller – is he's going on the IL, of course, with a shoulder injury, but they said he hopes to be uh, starting a throw-in program later this week. MRI showed inflammation similar to the one he dealt with in the past, so it's a lingering off and on throughout his career. So hopefully it's minor. Time will tell on this one, Ben. Obviously, we can't drop him yet, I'd imagine. But what are we what are we thinking with Bobby Miller? Because it's just another guy in line with, we're going to throw 96-plus and hit the IL. Yeah, well, I, that comment about him starting a, a, th- a program soon is promising. Uh, it's kind of weird how they're willing to have him start throwing so quickly. If they're so, it, it's kind you kind of wonder how mild the injury actually is. If it's are this being extra cautious because with Miller, like I had FOMO and this kind of uh, squashed that FOMO. Um, I mean, he could come back and give you 140 awesome innings, like he looks like he's going to, but uh, and going on with that FOMO so it's something I've had to react to fortunately I guess but it does stink and um yeah definitely hold on to him still even if you don't have IL spots and uh I trust the Dodgers to handle him uh carefully and correctly because uh he's part of their future and uh like the, their IL is like is the such a good rotation right now for their starters yes. it's, it's it's insane how many good players are hurt for them yeah because Bueller had a bit of a setback in his last rehab start they're expecting him back this week he'll need another rehab start I believe Thursday at triple eggs he had a comebacker end his outing last time so he'll be back soon some of the news actually like right before we jumped on here is landon knack and um kyle hurt like two of the prospect pitchers are rumored to take the spot this week kyle hurt reportedly as of like five minutes before the show a beat reporter said kyle hurt has entered the locker room so uh we'll have more news after this show is done being recorded but if anybody's curious if you're in daily move leagues if you're into something like that that looks like the likely move. We'll see for how long, because I'd imagine Bueller will come back and fill that void. But yeah, you mentioned it's good that Miller wants to throw already. Again, I'm with you also. You maybe slow play this with a young arm, but we'll see. But like you know, Nick Pavetta said that he's already thrown a couple times, played catch. Framber Valdez played catch on Monday morning. Like some of these guys are saying, some of it's more muscular because they're getting ahead of it than these guys that are actually like tearing things. So it's it's just a whole weird gamut we're playing with right now. So we'll wait and see. Cody Bradford, IL, back stiffness. That was a bummer because he's been pitching great. It was like a day after Brochi goes, yeah, he's locked into the rotation. We're not taking him out of the rotation. And then, boom, IL. Well, you technically didn't take him out of the rotation, so that's fair, Boach. Um, it speeds Michael Lorenzen up, though. He's going to pitch on Monday, two-step this week. If you have Cody Bradford, are we holding just for the back injury because we don't know the full extent of it? I think it's an easy cut if you need to because he was already he was like he's a waiver wire flyer like he doesn't throw hard he's not overpowering. The situation was great being on the Rangers, of course, because uh, he already got that one win last week, and I kind of feel a little bad. He was actually someone I wrote up last week um, in my in my article as a waiver ad, but uh, 
at least you got that one start out of him if you if you did add him. And um, yes, yeah, so it's funny because people are saying about looking at the 96 mile power plus uh, starters, and Cody's complete opposite. He throws like 90 according to fan graphs at least. So he's a, one of those softer throwers. But uh, no one's safe. This is just showing that, and uh, it's kind of unfortunate because he was gonna get like he had the chance of the rotation, like you said, and uh, he could have been a really big uh, fab ad. Maybe someone like Braxton Garrett possibly was last year. Like not a hard thrower, but uh, just reliable. Yep, reliable. Got a lot of offense behind him to give some run support. There's a, a lot to like there, so we'll see. Um, I didn't drop him just yet, but yeah, he'll be like the next guy if I need to make a move. He's he's definitely on that agenda and michael lorenzo let's just see what he can do he's never really been a consistent world beater probably more of a you know ben might write about him as a streamer from time to time this year let's put it that way it might not be more of a full-time thing tommy fam rumor started swirling on sunday that he is close to a deal with the chicago white Sox. that led him to get bid on in many leagues maybe we'll talk about him later i haven't checked if he's that popular but um as of monday as of this recording nothing yet let's put it that way nothing yet uh, has officially taken place, but Fam has been productive in the past. He really hasn't been. I think we can both agree. White Sox don't really have a whole lot holding him back. So, uh, what would your interest be in a guy like Tommy Fam if he's available out there? Yeah, so I didn't really, I didn't really react to the signing at all last year in my Fab bids. I, maybe it was because I didn't really need to, need outfield help. Um, like we we're talking about before, I, I kind of need the outfield help on the one team now that I lost to uh, say on a couple spots. But um, yeah, so the minor league deal is kind of weird. I feel like if he was in a play right away, he'd be it'd be a major league deal, right? So the, the like I don't get. Well, maybe they just want to see if he's like in, in shape and he can perform. That's my, so, that's my guess, yeah. Because he didn't have a full spring training, so it might be a month till we see him. Um, but this could be one of those signings where they, they want to flip him at the deadline because there's no reason for them to have Tommy Pham throughout the whole season. But uh, if he does, once he does get called up to the full the major league roster, I definitely take a, like a. a a flyer on him. I know in my main event leagues, um, I think he was bid on across the board or close to it. So people are being aggressive with that because it's hard to get that power speed combination. And uh, you just, I mean, he may help out guys like Andrew Vaughn and Andrew Vaughn. <laughs> That's all that's yeah, really left. <laughs> like, like, like Yancey says, White Sox have gross been leading off every day. LOL. And I think it was either the first pitch pod to my article. I said, when I mentioned the fam news, I'm like, what could it hurt? They're already starting Robbie Grossman. Might as well throw. And there was a little tidbit that came down a couple hours ago that Eloy Jimenez was activated off the IL, not starting on Monday, but he's back with the team. We'll see how that goes. So, quote, unquote, depth might be coming for now. But, yeah, fam, fam could definitely warrant it. Uh, you mentioned uh, added across the main event in your league. I saw a lot of smart people tweeting about him. I know Curlin was in on him, but, like, Toby. Toby put bids yep, in on him Toby. everywhere. And we can all say what we want about a lot of different experts, quote unquote, that post things. But if Toby's in on something, I'm at least interested. Let's put it that way. Like I'm get what he's what he's doing. I'll pay attention to. So, yeah, I've always been a Tommy Fam fan. Uh, probably more of a maybe streamer in twelves, but a, a locked in spot on fifteens if he gets that playing time. In Marlins, um, I don't know how deep we want to go on each of these, but it's just more like a slew of stuff. And I didn't even put the last couple bits that have come out today because they're not as relevant. But we'll start with this. Edward Cabrera got activated. He's actually starting right now in dealing against the Giants. So he's back for those that he was supposed to be back. Then he's supposed to have a rehab start. And now he's back. Kind of makes sense why he's back because A.J. Puck was scratched with an illness. Was it the I can't throw good flu or is he actually sick? Questions to be decided later. And Braxton Garrett now has dead arm after his last rehab start, nothing to do with his shoulder injury. So I'm just going to lump those three together for you, Ben. Um, Edward Cabrera, we obviously want to see how he pitches this game and his second start this week before Sunday comes. But give me your interest in a guy like Cabrera. What are you doing with Puck? And how nervous are you about Braxton Garrett? I know I lumped them all together, but we can have some fun with this. Uh, so I have Braxton on a DC and I had him in my lineup when I was doing lineups earlier today. And it was very sad taking him, taking him, taking him out like an hour ago. Cause he had the shoulder or arm injury in spring training. And now it's gotta be connected. There's, he's just not hundred percent. I don't think, which is unfortunate because you know how much I love Braxton last year. And uh, that shoulder, I would have kept drafting him if he didn't have that injury, but it's definitely don't start on my, well, the deadline already passed now for weekly league. So um, hopefully everyone got them out of their lineups if they had them. Uh, Cabrera, he uh, he was someone I just couldn't draft because that walk rate. Um, I'm sorry, he's dominating the Giants right now, but um, yeah, as you know, he could fall off the tracks at any point. So maybe oh, that'll yeah. happen. But um, yeah, so I mean, like if he 
starts if he's available like in a shower league uh i remember you asked me about yahoo so he's definitely available he was like 17 percent rostered in yahoo when you asked me yep. so in a 12 team format you can go out and add him if someone already hasn't but uh yeah if he comes out like with however like seven strikeouts one or zero walks then i would definitely put a or try to add him cabrera and uh see if he has some better control which i mean like, like we're seeing with tanner scott it can come and go each year or each month probably but he has enough strikeout upside where it's worth taking a shot on uh, Edward Cabrera. And then Puck, um, I guess they want him in the rotation because they, they sent down Max Meyer. And uh, if Braxton's not coming back anytime soon, I guess Puck's safe. But I don't know if you want to start Puck if he's in the rotation right now because he's he's been rough. Yeah, Puck is not starting for me anywhere I have him. Those are mainly DCs now because like, I dropped him in all my 12s. Uh, he, he's gone in that regard. You mentioned Cabrera. It's like he's got seven Ks right now with one through – three and a third innings it's ridiculous and this is why i wanted him for this giant start because this giant's offense outside of going off the other day in tampa has been pretty much garbage as much as it comes down to and you had cabrera going um in this one and then he goes at chicago this weekend which was kind of enticing uh one would say what i wanted this giant start badly so i can see how he does if you're in daily leagues to see if you want that cub start with no say that's already a plus when you're looking at those things, but uh, next week he'd be scheduled to face the nationals, which is also another good start. So he will be heavily bitted on. I have a feeling barring something crazy there. You mentioned um, Max Meyer. Now this is the one where if you want to get Twitter in a flurry, it's mess with someone's prospects. And that's what happened here is the Marlin sent down Max Meyer, which a lot of people thought, like you said, it kept puck up, so it's cleared the spot for Cabrera. But at the same time, people were like, oh, if Cabrera's throwing Monday, Meyer's going down, that's where Braxton Garrett's going to pitch. Like, it made sense, you know, connecting all the dots. Obviously, we decided that's not the case. With Meyer going down now, they're doing the Yuri Perez plan. They say he's going to throw three innings a start, like one start a week, monitor his innings, blah, blah, blah. Are you dropping Max Meyer? I have him in the main event on one team, and I plan to try to hold okay. because he, he uh, looked great in his first – two or three outings and uh, I had him in my lineup this week and then I was upset to take him out as well. So uh, the Marlins aren't being kind to me uh, right now. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, well, the thing is the problem is they have no incentive to bring him up right now because they're such a train wreck. The Marlins are. And, but like I saw people like Rob D DPH are talking about if he's going to pitch Meyer in the minors and why does have, does have him pitch in the majors? Like, I agree. This is, it doesn't make sense. And unless they're going to like, take advantage of the minor leagues and have them pitch like every seventh day or something where you can't do that in the majors. I don't know what their plans are, but uh, whatever their plans are, they aren't working. Yep. No, I'm with you. That's what makes no sense. Throw them, throw them behind an opener. Let them be the middleman in a game for three innings. That's what you want. It makes no sense at all, but that's the Marlins in a nutshell. Last bit of news for the Marlins. Jake Berger went on the IL with an oblique strain. He says it feels like the one he had with the White Sox last year where he only missed 10 days. If that's all it is, we wait and see, but probably just wait for more news on that one. Manny Rivera will be the guy taking those reps. Um, so yeah, Suzuki, this one dropped just a couple hours ago as well, which was a big like rush and get your lineups fixed moment. Not cool at all because he's been balling out. Seiya has looked outstanding, picking up right where he left off in the second half last year. Many of us have documented and discussed this. We loved how he finished. This is what we want in drafts. He was backing it up. A weak injury. Ben, this is what Seiya had last spring that kept him out for six weeks before he joined the Cubs last year. We don't know the severity of it yet, but what's it going to take for you to drop Saya in your formats? So I will say, so he did have an oblique last year, but it's the other oblique, it's the other oblique now. So he hurt his left one last year, which is more important for him as a left, as a right-handed hitter. This one's his right one. So he may have hurt it fielding or something. So I, that's a good thing right off the bat for me. So I'm not as worried. Um, it could be like a burger situation where he's back in 10, 10 days, hopefully. Um, at least with the Cubs are trying to, well, also with the Cubs, they're playing for something, so they, they want to be sure. cautious. They, they want him for the whole season. So maybe it's like two weeks he's gone. But if since it's, it's, it's his um, right oblique, I'm not as worried as if it, if it were his left one just because of how the, the swinging motion works with a right-handed hitter. So, uh, yeah, so it, it definitely stinks. Like I have him on a few teams, uh, and he was doing great, like you said. It's, I don't know, it's one of those late Monday IL things. I told you I got screwed over in a league where I have my – I'm taking a zero because of it. But uh, – this whole, yeah, definitely don't drop them if you don't have IL spots. It say is definitely a hold. Definitely a hold. Yep, I'm with you for now. Look, hang on as long as you can for a guy like Seiya Suzuki. Again, if you guys need more news, check out my Substack daily news update or go to 
um, the First Pitch Podcast. I drop Monday through Friday for you to get you caught up on all of the nonsense that's taking place around baseball. All right, let's talk about the, the some tidbits. Tidbits. You said you're doing a streaming article each week. Um, it, it's over at SportsEthos.com. Our boy Joe Rico is doing uh, running that show over there. For the, as far as I'm aware, he's running the show over there. Um, tell us what you got going here, and like what your I guess criteria. Since this article's already out, the week's already started. We can give a little behind the scenes so people know what to expect from from Ben this this season. Sure. Yeah, I I don't feel bad talking about it since since it was first Sunday Fab, so we can kind of spill the beans on who I wrote about but yeah so this is week number two of the article um i wanted to give like a little time before i could recommend anyone instead of like recommending off of three days there's no point in doing that but so i the article is broken up into two parts well i guess it's gonna be three parts eventually the first part's gonna be a recap so i suggested a couple a few guys last week um i did not write about their performance yet Uh, i am tracking it though i have like a little tracker i set up but i'll be touching on um my four recommendations from last week when I write up next week's article and I'll be grading myself throughout the season. So like, uh, so for example, I have uh, merit based ads and I have matchup based ads. So the merit base is just more about pitchers who may have not looked so good so far, but their underlying metrics are looking good. Or maybe they have, they have performed well, like Michael Lorenzen did last year for a period of time. He's who's a streamer. Then he turned into someone you wanted to roster for a long period of time. So that's more of the merit based ads. And then the matchup base is more straightforward. Like, if you're facing the, the A's, then I'm probably going to write you up because I always want to target the A's, the White Sox, the Road Rockies, things like that. And, um, yeah, so I uh, – like, so for the for the for like the scoring system, I'm going off of, like, if, I, if the guy gives a win, um, a quality start, or hits six strikeouts, uh, this is for the matchup base, then I'll give myself a, a W. And um, have a little fun with it, you know, just track it. And uh, the, the criteria to – um, for the selections that I'm making is it's through the it's based on the NFB um, NFBC main event and the starters have to be rostered in no more than 30% of leagues so I wanted to make it like actually actionable if you're in a deep league because I, I'm sure you've heard this too before but when you hear like fab suggestions they go like 50% 60% and I feel like half the time whether it's baseball or another sport those guys aren't available in my league so it's kind of pointless I mean not that I'm, I need to listen to people to tell me who to add but like if mm-hmm. you're relying on these if you're new to like fantasy and you're relying on these suggestions well half the guys you can't add so what's the point so by leaving at 30 percent it's i'm definitely scraping the bottom of the barrel it's making me work but this was born out of what i do already for my um, main events so i'm like doing the same work already i'm like i've, I've cleaned it up obviously so it's i have to present it to others um in a weekly format so i'm making it better for myself as well and uh as we talk about our ads you'll see that i, I did listen to my own advice in this few instances <laughs> at least this week yeah no and what you're doing is probably what, what i enjoy the most when i do my waiver wire stuff because the only reason why i do 50 to 60s is because it's for like the yahoo people of the world because those are everywhere i had but, no idea uh, that was your percentage i was just saying an example no no it's, <laughs> it's how it's been everywhere i've been it's been anywhere between 50 and 60 yeah, no matter it's where common for the t- for the be yeah, that high. That, that's so, like you're right on the number there and um, it just kind of highlights, hey, these guys might be available in your leagues. You know, check it out. You never know. Because even this last week doing like OCs, there'd be like these random guys that showed up. And I was just like, whoa, like, <laughs> how's this guy still available? But just stuff like that happens. But the the fun of the fab is kind of where you're headed down below there. The longer shot, deeper league guys. Like if you look at my waterfalls, they consist mostly of the bottom half of my recommended players probably on my on my uh, waiver wire column so it fits what you're talking about is you know in the leagues i'm in most of these guys i'm telling you like they're not available but for most some people my good dms you probably get dms other people do that they are so it, it makes a ton of sense i, I like the streaming stuff because um it, with all the injuries these days we live in a world of we basically are streaming most of our roster at times it feels like and it's going to only get better with all the injuries we talked about so um, if we may, I have a question for your first streamer here. I want to hit you up with this one because I'm curious your thoughts because I did look at him quite a bit this week. You got Jose Soriano here of the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. He um, came in, made this kind of spot startish. They stretched him out to 60 pitches his last time. The under the hood stuff looked good, um, and they're gonna. He's got a two step this week. So I'm curious what uh, what you were discussing there too, or at least let the listeners know what you're discussing there to kind of merit uh, adding Soriano this week. Yeah, so he was someone who made the transition from the bullpen to the rotation. He was 
I, I actually drafted Soriano as a, a save spec in one of my early DCs, um, but now I get a starter out of it, at least for now. So it's, it's still, he's still a valuable pick if you did that in a draft and hold format. And the, so the one thing, uh, so I touched on early in, in, in the piece was that he had a lot of strikeout potential last year. He struck out 56 and 42 innings, which is fantastic. Um, that's like three for every two innings. And then, uh, but he also had a walk issue at the same time, which as a reliever, you can get away with. Uh, there's plenty of closers who have high walk rates, but um, as a starter, you can't really do that. But in his first outing, in, his, in the brief um, four innings he pitched, I don't, I don't think he walked anyone or he had a, yeah, he, had, he didn't walk anyone, struck out six. So that, that was awesome. Um, he had a decent, decent swinging strike rate, 11%. And uh, I know you're familiar with the ball percentage because of Ryan, how much he talks about mm-hmm. it on uh, your other show. And Soriano's was only 32%. His, so that's, that's awesome. That's like probably almost elite. It's only one start. It's a sample of one, but it's definitely promising. And with everyone getting hurt or a lot of people getting hurt, you need these flyer uh, starters, especially in a deeper format. So like in an AL only league, he's, he's a, he was a definite ad this week. Um, in that DC, I didn't start him because the matchup wasn't the best. I think it's the Rays and uh, somebody else, but I didn't need to use him yet, um, fortunately. So it's just a good wait and see. And Soriano was under the underneath the merit based ads. I, I so I wasn't looking at the matchup to play him necessarily this week. But if you have to, I it's fine. Like if he pitches like he did against the uh, actually he faced the Rays last time. So I oh, he's, got, he's still got the Rays again. He's got the Rays in Tampa this time, and then Great American Small Park at the end of the week. Okay, so I was right about. Okay, I thought he was facing the race, but yeah, the um, Cincinnati star is definitely another reason why I didn't want to start him where I had him already. But he's more of like a wait and see, and I think he was added, if not in all of my main events, at least two of them probably. Yeah, no, he should have gotten a heavy ad this week. So I'm with you on that. the The two step was intriguing, but I love what you're saying. There is something that I've tried to kind of drill home to people, especially when I talk with Ryan on our, our um, waiver wire show on Thursday nights is sometimes it's good to look ahead and get a guy for the cheap, kind of what you're talking about, not so much to use him this week, but for down the line because what you did see, what he could be, and that can be huge as things continue on. So I like that a lot uh, with the Soriano club. I was curious what you were seeing, but we're kind of on the same page there. Talk to me about Ryan Feltner because I've seen a lot of smart people talking about him, and one of you know many biases that I have is I just turn my brain off to anybody that says Colorado SP. That's just a thing I just don't do. But Feltner's proven himself to be pretty serviceable so far. Yeah, I, I think my – so I have it pulled up right here. My first line was, uh, I know it's hard to get behind a Colorado pitcher, but I want you to bear, bear with me for a moment. And <laughs> That's fair. I, I hope people did because – I so I, I tweeted about this today. Um, I think it was when the Max Meyer news came out. So I actually replaced Meyer yes. with Feltner in a main event. Um, so Feltner's facing the, the Phillies this week, but they're, they're like, they have a 70 WRC plus against righties. And it's in Philadelphia. I'm like, if you, I prefer Feltner over like Colin Ray and someone else. But uh, with with a Feltner, it looks like he could be very valuable, um, at least in deeper leagues for now. I don't know if in a 12 team or a 10 team, I'd be trying to uh, pick him up because to your point, I'd only use him in like half the matchups anyway at the most right now. But um, as of when I wrote the article, he had a, he had a 3.27 ERA, Feltner in two starts, a one whip, and 14 strikeouts in 11 innings. Um, so that's that was a fantastic start. Uh, one of the starts he, he held, he was against the Rays in Colorado. He struck out ten in six innings. So the Rays aren't as good as they used to be, but that's still excellent in my mind, um, especially in Colorado. Uh, he has an awesome uh, K minus walk percentage, which uh, everyone who listens to your shows know how important that is. It's twenty two point seven percent. And I think his most recent start didn't really hurt these numbers. So this is from the article, which was published on Sunday, and I wrote it in uh, mid last week. Mm-hmm. His swing strike rate, I think I have that updated though. It is 12%, so it's good. Um, he has a ball percentage of point th- of 34%. His XERA is 2.66. Uh, Felner's exit velocity against is 86.8. So all these numbers are like awesome for someone who's available almost everywhere. Uh, and like I said, I'm already starting him in the main event, which could be awful, but it's not in Colorado. And so then I go a little bit deeper because of the spike in the swing strike rate and um, I don't usually go this deep with my own analysis, but since I'm writing, I wanted to like cover my bases to make sure I'm not recommending an awful suggestion. But on Savant, he's actually increased his four-seamer and slider usage this year by 10% each, and he reduced the sinker usage. So um, if you're familiar with how baseball, like this 
watching it works. The sinker doesn't really usually, usually get strikeouts. So mm -hmm. that makes sense in my mind that his strikeout rate has spiked with the reduction of the sinker usage. I mean, it has sort of, you still have to have a good four seamer and slider, but the X stats when I looked were, were both very good um, on this, on the, on those two pitches. So he made an adjustment. And so for me, I'm like, well, I don't take the chance then that it's something that could sustain potentially, at least, like I said, in the, in the road starts, but um, he's actually someone I had in all three main events because he was cheap and I could have spent a dollar. I didn't because there were no backup bids on any of my bids. And uh, I mean, it's things that I overbid, but it wasn't by much. Like I was in the teens on my bids, but uh, we'll get to that later. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens this week. Well, it's a good thing you bid on him regardless, because like you said, the Meyer news, and that's why um, I I think there'll be a point if he continues this trend of being serviceable, is what I'll say, because there's going to be hiccups with pretty much. That's the re one thing, as I'll say, is majority of any streamer you discuss at some point in time this season, there will be hiccups. Thus, that's why they're a streamer. You'll have the occasional, like you mentioned, Braxton Garrett last year. Maybe Soriano or Feltner becomes a guy that's just a staple in the deal, but maybe he's a bench streamer where you just keep him on your team and you don't drop him type stuff. There's angles to it, but there will be some rough outings for all of them. So people need to like already have that baked into their mind when they make these moves. But I could foresee even Feltner being 12 team viable if he keeps this going. And that's just where between the injuries, between just looking for a guy that can go five or six and not get destroyed anymore. Like that's just a very powerful tool. So uh, it's interesting. I was curious what, what uh, you had to say about it. And uh, yes, I, I will, I will pay more attention to that one. And then the last one I want to ask you about here is Jose Buto. Cause um, he was a very popular name in fab on Sunday night and a very popular name on uh, that on the Twitter sphere, wherever you were looking last night or even this morning. So what are you seeing with Mr. Buto, who has quote unquote gotten the he's going locked to be locked into our rotation comments from his Mets manager? <laughs> yeah, so I actually put him in the wrong section looking back at it. I he was a matchup based ad for me, even though he's facing the Dodgers. It was just it was just so barren already and the on the freezing or like on the roster percentage side. So I'm like, well, he has good stuff, so I'll throw him in here. And uh and this was before the Sunday start. So I I don't know if I got lucky or also like he, he so if you, it's kind of unfortunate it happened that's when they start if you're trying to get Budo on the cheap because I mean I know some people already liked Budo but now as you probably you saw the prices skyrocketed and uh some of the things I pointed out when I wrote about Budo was his swing strike rate was 12.2 percent and his one start at the time um and part of the the reason I put him under the matchup base versus the other uh section which is more of the merit base was well the Dodgers strike out 27 percent of the time against righty so uh I'm like, well, if he's good enough, there's a chance he could survive that start. But I, like, I wouldn't really at, play him in LA. But people might now, based on how much they spend on him, like the price people spend on Budo kind of justifies starting him right away. I mean, I don't get why you would spend a hundred dollars or close to it and then not start him. But uh, I don't know. It's also kind of a, le a leap of faith that he's going to stick around because the McGill note when he went, when he was injured was that it wasn't supposed to be an extended absence. And I've held on to McGill in at least one spot. This is Ty Tyler McGill. Yep. But uh, I mean, if Budo's dominating, like if he has a great start against the Dodgers, that's going to be three great starts and the Mets are kind of competitive now. I mean, they're more of a wild card team, but I could see them maybe moving Manaya or Hauser out of the rotation and then keeping Budo in if McGill comes back. Yeah, that'd be the only trick because like I'm looking at the Rotowire projected starters grid, and next week they have McGill pitching on Thursday, and Budo's out of the rotation. So obviously, yeah. the Mets manager said Budo's the guy. So who moves? Maybe Budo gets shelled, makes that you know decision easier for who knows? I guess the Dodgers. Like they, they they have had some massive goose eggs this year, and then they've had some other like you know Dodgers performances. But um, we'll see. Yeah, you said Manaya. There's Hauser. Hauser actually wouldn't be bad in the bullpen, honestly. That might be a better world for Adrian Hauser. So we'll wait and see. But, uh, yeah, we'll talk more about some Budo price tags here probably very shortly uh, as we look at things. But, yeah, so everyone check out Ben's article, uh, The Tidbits. That comes out, sorry, what day does it come out? Friday? Saturday? So I write it, like, on Thursday, but it, it, uh, Joe releases it on Sunday for uh, right, Fab. Man. Yeah, that's right. So. You guys have a bunch of stuff coming out on Sunday. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So that, he, he has a tweet storm, it seems like, every that one day. Yeah, so I remember seeing that yesterday. A bunch of them coming out there for Fab, which, you know, that's an important day to have Fab coming out. So everyone check that out over there at Sports Ethos. All right, let's talk about some Fab. As usual, we use the NFBC OC, 12 teamers. Kind of gives us a rough idea of what uh, is going on in 12-team formats. Obviously, there's even 
more movements or less movement depends on how you look at it and like yahoos of the world and whatnot but we'll start here the most added player and i cannot wait to discuss this kirby yates added 197 leagues as high as 217 as low as a dollar kirby yates went as low as a dollar this is why i wasn't bidding high on him as i love i liked kirby yates a lot i did but um and I, I think Jose Leclerc's garbage made that very well known a few times on Twitter and elsewhere. But uh, the idea of spending this much on Kirby Yates, who I think could definitely be the closer. They still have Dan uh, Robertson as well. Very good potential closer. But where were you in this Yates um, bidding wars, I guess, that was going on out there? I don't want to brag, but I've been very blessed with closers. And I should knock on wood for saying that because uh, it could change in an instant. But I did not bid on Yates anywhere. Um I just wanted to, there was no need for me to really do it. And uh, I, I was talking to Curlin and he was agonizing over how, how much to bid. He ended up getting him. So I'm glad it worked out for Mike. But yeah, uh, he bid a lot, a lot more than he wanted to. Yep. Probably let you know about that too. <laughs> yeah. I, I did see his tweet. I think he was like, he almost doubled the runner up, which I, yep. I mean, he had, he, he had kind of lost two of his, his two closers. He needed or, a closer. Yeah. He has Leclerc. So he needed to make sure he got um, Yates. But the thing was with Robertson, like, I don't know. So if you're looking at roster resource, they're co-closers, Yate and Robertson right now. If you look at, so the other one I have access to is Closer Monkey, uh, which is basically reliever recon. It's uh, They have Yates ahead of Robertson, but it's still a committee. So if, I don't know. I feel like Robertson is probably the better play since he's been the closer more recently. But, um, and he's been, he's pitching well. So as far as I've seen Robertson, I mean, Yates has two. I'm looking at his yeah. his stats, and uh, he's got five. Well, he hasn't really pitched much, though, either. Yates, he, five innings, five Ks, and a win. So he hasn't even gotten a save yet, and people are just taking a leap of faith that he's going to be the closer now or at least a full-time closer. Um, it's definitely one of those potential light your money on fire situations. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, but when if you're in a, like a 15-team league like Curlin and I play most of the time, you're, you get desperate for saves. Um especially if you can hit on someone I, I've hit on someone before in free agency and, and it's, it play, it pays off massively more than what your bid is. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's tricky. It's uh, this week's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out in Texas. Yeah. Like I get the appeal to it because say, especially the deeper the format, I get it a hundred percent. It was just interesting to me, I guess that he went for so much more. It felt like than like Foley's and Ginkles went for a couple of weeks ago, kind of close to the Foley range, I guess. Ginkle, yeah, you could say Seawald's coming back where if Yates gets it, it should be his. So I get that argument behind it all. But I'm kind of like in the same boat where I think the committee makes more sense. I think Robertson's the guy they originally signed to be the closer. And then Yates is just pitching really well right now. So he could force his hand, which is fine. I could be totally wrong. But, you know, that's why, A, I didn't bid that much in that regard. And, B, I didn't bid as much because I'm kind of in the same boat you are, Ben, where – I've been fortunate like with my closing situation and you know, a lot can change it before this podcast is even over to make me regret saying that, but it's just one of those things. And I, I laugh doing uh, that first pitch pod. I update saves for the nights on every show and like the save leaders, I got four or five saves. Most of them weren't in that elite tier of closers. They were like the late guys, which is really, you know, kind of dwindling back to the old days of the save situation all over again, like long ways to go. That could obviously flip. I'm not crazy in that regard. It's just um, interesting to see. So, I don't know. I was not nearly as excited as everybody else about Kirby Yates on this one. I, I could be wrong. I could eat my words, but I just feel like a lot of a lot of money for a potential committee situation where you had David Robertson added in 30 leagues because he's already probably rostered in most places. He went as high as 188 and as low as 5 bucks. So, where he was available, people were slightly still like aggressive on him, let's say, at 188. And then down to – there was no dollar bids for David Robertson. So that kind of says something to me, honestly, at 12 that no one went for the, the freebie with David Robertson. So we'll see long ways to go on this one. We'll see how it plays out, but Leclerc uh, is not the guy, in my opinion, if he comes back, it's going to be pure Twitter chaos. It's going to be absolutely amazing. If Leclerc comes back and takes the role. All right, let's talk about the next most added player here. Colton Cowser. This did not surprise me one bit as high uh, in 165 leagues, as high as 456. Okay, steep, fine. But what I respect the most in 12-team leagues here, the men bid was 127. So no one got a freebie when it came to Colton Cowser. Ben, you know my joke, because like I already made with Kirby Yates. 
doesn't matter who it is. I feel like even with the LED of the crew, is, there's probably like a $4 bid or something. Like someone gets them for free. Um, no one got a freebie with Kowser. So to all UOC players, thank you. Congratulations. Um, if you got them for a freebie, it's because you got them last week. Uh, so what's your thoughts on Kowser? Because I usually don't bid high. I went to like one, um, I think I went in over between 119 and 139. I had zero shares of Colton Kowser right now. But uh, what were your thoughts on this going into the Fab Weekend? It was easier for me because he was already available, or I mean, unavailable in all my leagues. So I, I missed out on all the fun. But uh, <laughs> there you go. But for the sake of the podcast, so uh, I have a stat cast up, and it is a lot. There's a lot of red. The only blue is really his uh, his um uh, like plate approach. So he has a low K or a high K rate, not the best walk rates, but uh, median percentile and a uh, kind of a high whiff rate. So those are the only two things. But he's he's a rookie. He's young, but there's a lot of red, even in the speed department. And it looks like he's not platooning right now. I mean, they haven't really faced – the Orioles haven't faced too many lefties. He did start the last game against the lefties, Kowser. Um, he had second that one game against the Red Sox, I believe. Uh, I was watching that game. He was just destroying baseballs. And, uh, yeah, it's def- he's definitely uh, probably like the first big fab ad, I think, that we've had uh, yeah. so far. And uh, he wasn't even called up, which – well, I mean, he was called up, but like it was a, like a delayed ad, which is – different from what we were used to i think because of the platoon situation how stacked the orioles are a lot of people to get in on the cheap if they went in a week early which a lot of people in, my, in the main event of course everyone's sharp so they're on top of that stuff but uh yeah i missed out uh hopefully it works for everyone who got him just not enough to beat me yeah he was a funny one because pretty much drafted universally no matter your format like 12s because the platoon they dropped him because he was he wasn't even playing versus righties all the time like if he was a bad platoon and then last week, he just goes bonkers, plays runs right, he's left. He's AL Player of the Week, was announced on Monday for Colton Kowser. Five home runs on the week for Colton Kowser. Um, and then even on Monday's lineup, there was a dead giveaway, obviously, after Fab has taken place. But um, Austin Hayes was platooning with Andy, Anthony Santander on Monday. Now, I don't know how much that's going to be in because Santander's a switch hitter, so, and Hayes has been really bad. Maybe it's just an off day for Anthony. We'll see. But um, it's just... There's so many riches in Baltimore right now because, like, someone's asked, I think Bloomfield and I, the last two shows, when's Kirstead getting called up? I'm like, there's no room. It's like, there's no room at the end. There's just nowhere for him to go. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Mullen's even hit a home run on Sunday. So, a trade might most likely or an injury before the big guys, but Kowser's locked in right now. So, I, um, I wanted some Kowser, did not get any Kowser because I'm just too much of a scaredy cat to go too bid ha- happy, probably. And that's one of my detriments, uh, when it comes to, to fat bidding. All right, next person off the board here, Jeff Hoffman. I'm, people are getting sharper, Ben. People are getting sharper here. Hoffman, 149 leagues, as high as 115, as low as a dollar. Hoffman picked up another win over the weekend. He's been sharing high leverage or late inning roles with Jose Alvarado, I should say. And he's got like a save or two on the season, got a couple wins. He's looked pretty good. I was in on Hoffman, not even close to this extent of the pricing. But uh, what are your thoughts on Jeff Hoffman? Because I'm starting to live in a world where pitching so bad that I'll take these good relievers right about now over a lot of starting pitchers that are out there. Uh, so before we get into the analysis, funny uh, thing to mention is I was on a, a little league team with Jeff Hoffman back in the day. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. He, he used to live at where I, where I live. And uh, I never faced him in high school cause he ended up moving in. I was a couple years older than him, but uh, yeah. So it's, it's always cool when someone that you played with makes it big. And uh, yeah, so I did have a bit on Jeff. Um, it was a small one. It's, it's like I, I mentioned before with the H, I didn't really need a lot of closer help, but one of my main events, I had Finnegan as my RP2. And in that draft, I took Yimi, uh, Jimmy Garcia just for, for a little like, insurance. So I had a small bit on Hoffman just to have someone in case something goes south with Finnegan because he's probably my least comfortable closer that I roster right now. Uh, but, yeah, I, people were aggressive. Like you said, 115 in OC is a lot, and I don't think he's – has. does he have a save yet? Um, yeah, he's got at least – He's got one save, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so people are seeing – well, everyone was talking about Hoffman in the offseason for DCs. Uh, yes, he was – was, you couldn't talk about Alvarado or anybody else without mentioning Hoffman. Um, but, yeah, so I, I get it because he's a right-handed uh, pitcher. I mean, but they do have Soto, the Phillies, so it's not like they need Alvarado for lefties, but he might be kind of like the leverage guy mm-hmm. is the term that's used now. And, uh, yeah, so uh, – Closer Monkey has Alvarado as the committee lead and Hoffman's first in line, but is kind of like co-closer, I guess. So I get it. Like if you're desperate for saves, um, he was definitely the much affordable 
honestly, I would rather have gone after Hoffman than um, yes. than uh, Yates based on the prices and the situations. You just nailed where I was going with that. I was, I was much more in on Hoffman than Yates in pretty much every league I was bidding on. Um, I think I might have got a Hoffman shirt. We'll recap, recap that. It said, that right there tells you I'm in too many leagues when I say that. So I'll uh, I'll let you know. But I know I was I was much more interested in Hoffman this week. I even wrote about him. But yeah, he's been um, his last two outings last week. He picked up a save and he picked up a win. Those are his two start two two outings. So that says everything you know about the leverage situations he's going into. Um, in, in those same uh, situations, I should give the update here for Philly. Uh, when he got the win, Alvarado pitched that game. So did Soto. I think that was an extra inning game. But when he got the save, uh, Dominguez, Soto, and Strong got the holds. Alvarado didn't even get used. Um, Al- Alvarado didn't get a save. He only pitched once all last week. So it's just an interesting way of watching and that could change weekly with that team. Uh, I think we even said, like you mentioned, Hoffman for DCs in this year. When we looked at that bullpen in Philadelphia, there were so many mouths to feed because uh, Ryan O'Kirkring is still coming back any day now. So that that was my only thing that concerned me with Hoffman is do they when Kirk Ring comes back give him some love again? I don't know, but I liked Hoffman a lot, so I was still very very intrigued with that one. All right, uh, next on the agenda here was Mr. Jose Buto, who uh, was it Buto or Buto? You're up in New York. I think it's Buto. Buto. That's what I thought. I just want to make sure I was make sure I pronounced things properly. But uh, 142 leagues as high as 157, as low as a dollar. Kind of hit on most of the things already with him, but I guess I was just surprised by how much heavy bidding took place there with Jose. Yeah, it's someone gone for one buck still, so it's, it's always welcome to the OCs. It's all it's like all reliable to, yep. for the most part. Yeah, so uh, 157 is definitely a lot. Like like I said, it's risky. He could get sent down uh, at some point. Um, it's, if you're spending that much money, I feel like you kind of want someone to stick around for a while. And just what, since I have his fan graphs up, so I'll touch on some points real quick. So he has a low bad, of course, 208 against. It's going to happen when you have a 0.75 ERA. He has a uh, high left on base, of course, so that's 90%. Makes sense. Um, his indicators are all in the twos, his X ERA, FIP, and X FIP. So, I mean, he's dominating. Um, so that's all good. I, where's the Sierra? I don't have the Sierra offhand, but I'm sure it's in the same ballpark. Yeah, so I uh, – I get it. Um, we talked about him, 14.4% swinging strike rate, so he's missing bats, and uh, yeah, hopefully it uh, works out. Yeah, no, I actually have him and a handful of uh, DCs because I remember last nice. year when he came up and spot started, he was good, and that's like the perfect format in my mind to have him because I can in, out, don't have to worry about things. Like We can have some fun with it, so uh, we'll see how that keeps going. Mr. Budo, again, you mentioned Dodgers this week. Hold your breath, maybe. All right, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts here because when we recap my uh, fab acquisitions for the week, this name will get mentioned often, and that is Yeriel Rodriguez of the Toronto Blue Jays. They picked him up from Cuba this year. He was added in a 138 leagues, as high as 242, as low as a dollar. Did not come close to that high bid, thank goodness. But uh, he made his debut on uh, Saturday. Three and two-thirds innings, one run, two walks, six Ks. Um, let me give you the exact number here real quick. He threw do, 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 where's it at? He threw 68 pitches. Um, the goal, I believe they said, is for him to go four to five starts or four to five innings right now. Like he had two starts in the minors, six and a third innings, 10 Ks, um, no earned runs. He looked filthy at triple A. A lot can obviously change, but the fact that he shows um, some big strikeout stuff, he showed that in Cuba, one of the bigger prospects coming over from Cuba. It got my attention. The uh, Jays need help pitching if they could set him up with the right opener see like flip it don't make him the opener make someone else the opener be real nice but even if he can kind of get stretched out to five innings to start i'd be okay with that so what's your thoughts on Rodriguez though you could tell me if i'm a complete fool for this one and that's fine but i was very uh within a world we're pitching again that's what you said way too many times is nasty this guy at least intrigued me a little bit well it depends on what you'd bid for him uh, yeah i you... was below 40 bucks all right yeah then you, you were so I'm telling Great you, like, I wasn't even close yep. to this high bid number. Not even close. No, yeah, that's, that's that's like just being um, irresponsible with your fab when you're bidding 242 on them. I'm with you on that part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, I I didn't bid on Rodriguez. Um, I was kind of I was kind of annoyed that he took Bowden Francis's spot, but that's not the reason why I didn't bid on him. Um, hey, Bowden, Bowden got the got the win that day. If they yeah, you kind of redeemed himself. Way, I didn't get a zero. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't the, wasn't the end of the world for that. But with uh, Yariel, he. Uh, it's more of the workload. Like you, you mentioned you had more info on like their plan for him, but yeah, like he, he's, it's like Mason Miller last year, almost where it's, mm-hmm. 
a reliever starting and you're not going to get wins probably for a while. Uh, if he's, if his max is going to be five innings then it's almost like one every 10 starts, if you're lucky, probably if he makes that many starts, but like looking at his, uh, his fan graphs, he, he does definitely profiles like, like a reliever. So in the minors, his K rate was 41.7%, which is like hater or Williams. And he has the walk rate of them of like 12.5%. And that's what it was in, in his start was 12.5% his walk rate K rate of 37.5, but it's only, it's fewer than four innings. So you can't really say anything. Um, I would have liked to have seen more before I bid over a hundred dollars on him, but like what you bid was perfect in my mind. So uh, definitely worth it to see what happens. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm happy with it. Cause like you said, just to see what happens is kind of where I'm leading with this one. I'm trying to find where I saw that earlier, but I can't find it at the moment. I'll have to, um, I'll have to look it up some more as I, uh, later on I'll have it for you guys. But, um, yeah, I saw it like anywhere from like four ish innings, give or take, is the goal like 75 pitches, something like that. So we'll see where that goes. At least, and, and maybe the, the Marlins could take some notes. That's how you use a guy in the, in the bigs on, a, on an innings thing, Max Meyer, anybody like that's how you do it with Yar- Yariel Rodriguez. So, That'll be fun in that regard. Another, like, this is where it's getting annoying, Ben, is people are getting sharper because Brandon Marsh has picked up in 122 leagues. Now, I say sharper, I wouldn't have spent $151, like the max bid, but as low as five bucks. So, literally, every league he was bid on, there was no gimmies with Brandon Marsh. I, I, I gives me a little warm and fuzzy inside to see people doing that after so many times making fun of people. But, um, Brandon Marsh is putting together a nice little season here. He uh, came into today hitting 313 with four home runs and a stolen base, hitting sixth in that Phillies lineup. Um, I don't have a whole lot of negative things to say about Marsh. Maybe you can complain about his his uh, you know his hit tool once in a while, which is fair. But when you look at Brandon Marsh, what are your thoughts on him when it came to Fab this week? So I'm pretty sure he was he was already uh, in 15. He up and, have been gone. Yeah, he. I'm pretty sure he was long gone, so I didn't have to even consider Marsh, but. I did have him in a main event last year, and he was kind of frustrating because they platooned him a lot. And so I'm looking at his um, player page right now, and so he like I think Wit was Wit Merrifield was the platoon like the short side for Marsh at least to start the year. Um, I'm not sure how many lefties the the Phillies have faced recently, but Marsh definitely had a fantastic week. He had like two homers, hit 348. But the one thing that happened when I had him last year, and it's happening again this year, is his bad bit. So he got off to a fast start last year. Marsh did. And then it kind of came down once the Babbitt got closer to where it should be. I mean, he ended last year with a 397 Babbitt. Right now it's 440. But so you're right off the bat, you're coming down at least 40 percentage points to like where he hit last year, 277, which is good. Um, I always thought of Marsh as like a speed guy, but he doesn't really run for – like he had 10 steals last two years, which is fine, but it's not like – when you're hitting 12 and 11 homers, like he has uh, the same two years – it's more of a 15 play, I think. I mean, he's definitely hot right now, so that's why he's getting the action in 12s. But I, I just don't think the ceiling's there. I mean, he's kind of young. He's 26, so he could be breaking out at some point. But um, just make sure that – or just be wary of lefties on the schedule, and if he starts sitting, then he may not be a, a, a surefire start anymore. Yep. No, that's, that's totally fair. I I definitely had him in 15s last year, but I, I will use him in 12s, but streamable because it's not even – like right now he's the Merrifield platoon last year was the Johan Rojas platoon. Uh, for the most part, Rojas is playing every day in center field because of his defense and Merrifield's just not hitting. So it's leaving Marsh more opportunity to play. But like you said, all it really takes to play a cold spell and that all flips on its head all over again because the Phillies are super talented with depth. So um, run it while you can. I, the, the 151, not a fan of, but I respect that everyone's been at least five bucks on him. That was, that was, that was good to see people. We need more of that in our lives. A couple more guys here. We won't go too deep here. I want to mention Yvonne Herrera picked up at 119, 119 leagues as high as 116, as low as a dollar crushing baseballs. We know that, but I just, I, I want to throw this out here. People. I said, he's great. If he plays Wilson Contreras came back when they sent uh, pages back to the minors, the third catcher. Now Contreras played two out of three games over the weekend. And Yvonne sat Yvonne is sitting again on Monday. So just be prepared to back to getting three to four games at best out of Bivon right now until Contreras gets hurt again, then you can go at him. But those that spent 116 this week might be a little frustrated. Yeah, they probably did their fab on Thursday and then he mm-hmm. and then didn't look again until after the after it posted because yeah, he sat Friday and Saturday and then played Sunday. So yep, yep you covered everything basically. Yeah, just as I wasn't even gonna talk about him, I just wanted to bring that up because that might uh, be a stinger later on. Here's a guy I had 
Well, first, never would have predict, predicted putting this many bids in on this individual this season, but um, had a ton on the old waterfall on Sunday. Josh H. Smith of the Texas Rangers added 102 leagues as high as 65, as low as a dollar. For one, the dude has uh, flexibility. He can play at third, short, and outfield, which is beautiful. He's the primary third baseman with Josh Young out these days, which has been interesting. And um, bats left-handed. They have a good good um, schedule this week. The Rangers do, and he's already got starting one for two on Monday. But he's hitting over three hundred. No homers, no steals, but uh, intrigued a lot of people. So, what were you thinking when you saw Josh Young? Or not Josh Young, Josh Smith. Sorry, <laughs> I did that. Josh Young, though. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Uh, yeah. So I, I had a bid on at least on one team for Smith, and uh, yeah, he's like a temporary fill-in until hopefully Young gets back uh, healthy and soon. But yeah, I, I Smith was something I took in DCs last year because he was the third baseman until um, we're projected to be the third baseman. I think until Young was known that he's gonna be back. But yeah, he's Smith is crushing the ball right now. His stat cast is uh, very red. Um, the barrel rate's very low, so he maybe he's getting lucky right now. It's only two point nine percent, and the hard hits under thirty six percent. So not ideal for the power, but uh, he's fast. And uh, the, like you mentioned, the eligibility is awesome in NFBC. So he definitely was a fill-in option for me. I think at like third base or even outfield, and with the benefit of third base and shortstop. So he's yeah definitely continue to play him in these good um, schedules for the Rangers, where they're facing a lot of right-handed hitters, and at least until Young's back. Yep, yeah, I'm with you. I had a way, uh, and plus I was in a world where I had Royce Lewis. We know how that's going. Then I went to Juan Moncada. We know how that's going. So Josh Smith all of a sudden became very very interesting to me. Well, on, on Fab Day, which never thought would come. Right, uh, let's talk about uh, Martin Perez. Picked up in 98 leagues, as high as 122, as low as a dollar. Perez has been that boring, serviceable veteran, which he is more often than not the last few years. Uh, he's allowed four runs in 19 innings this year with 15 Ks. He's gone back-to-back -back quality starts with 13 Ks. Um, so far, so good through three and a third on Monday night. What were your thoughts on Perez, who, like I said, he, he had the Mets on Monday, and he's got Boston this Sunday. I had Perez in a couple of my uh, bid lists and a uh, fun um, plug. He was one of the pitchers I, I recommended last week for the, the matchup stream. So uh, that worked out go. well. If you read the sports ethos uh, article last week and added Perez, but uh, yeah, the, the two step this week, I forget who he was facing, but it was a little shaky. I think it was the Mets and somebody else Mets and the, um, the Red Sox. Yeah. So the Red Sox want the Red Sox matchup is kind of ideal because they have, they're so left-handed hitting heavy yep. and they were in Pittsburgh, I believe. Um, yep. Cause I, I wrote up Marco Gonzalez before he went on the IL for that, for that series as well as a, as a potential deep league uh, streamer. But um, yeah. And the Mets are kind of hot now. So it's kind of like one, okay, one bad matchup. And uh, well, Perez is pitching. All right. Like his doesn't have a swing strike rate. That's good. It's 8.5 right now. But his Sierra and XF are both both under four. Uh, his walk rate's only six point four percent, which is good for Perez. I think he's had a walk pro problem in the past. Um, the contact though against him is not very good. A uh, hard hit of fifty percent, and his exit velocity against is ninety two point six miles per hour. But um, oddly enough, the XERA is three point two nine. I think it's because it's all ground balls. So, um, so Perez is definitely a good streamer. Definitely in fifteen. I think he was added in all my main events if he wasn't already so i had him i actually added perez in one of my main events for last week which was very nice for that to pan out um i may have actually dropped him because i want i needed somebody else but uh yeah perez will probably be on and off rosters all year definitely in 12s and he might be someone to hold in 15s or something deeper but uh yeah what were the bids for perez they were probably too high but uh, yeah 122 is too high in an oc but um if someone gone for a, for a buck so good job whoever did that yeah, no, I know I had some bids in pretty cheap, not close to 122, but yeah, living in that world. A couple more, I'm going to jump around here. Gavin Sheets added in 82 leagues, as high as 51, as low as a dollar, with all the injuries in Chicago, not to mention a bunch of righties on the docket this week. Sheets has seen plenty of playing time, uh, hitting 286 on the year with two home runs, really kind of coming to his own the last week, playing every single day, flexing the muscle a bit there. Uh, what were your thoughts on Gavin Sheets this week? I had him in at least one one of my claim lists. Um, he actually started against a lefty on Saturday, which was kind of yep. eye opening. But now with Eloy back, that's one less one less spot for uh, Sheets. Um, he's not gonna play center field, so basically it's down to right field for Sheets. And if they want to keep playing Grossman, and then if Fam gets called up, then Sheets may be on the bench or on fantasy free agency 
uh, pretty soon. But uh, yeah, definitely a great week or a great ad for this week. I don't think I ended up getting them, but um, I saw the, I could see the appeal in adding them for this week. I think I did. Again, we will discuss that shortly. Uh, Jerickson Profar, he's been controversial, starting brawls against the Dodgers, but he's been producing at the plate. Profar added in 70 leagues, as high as 47, as low as a dollar. Um, he's hitting 321 on the year with eight extra base hits, two being home runs, striking out less than 20% of the time. He's looking quite serviceable out there. Was Profar on your agenda this week? Uh, I think I'm like one list. Maybe I didn't get Profar, but uh, he's looking at Russia Resource. Um, sorry, Mike, it's easier to go through there right now. Uh, but uh, they haven't hitting. He's been, he's hit fifth every game. So he's been back. Profar has so um, mm-hmm. that's that's a uh, that's enough for me, especially um, on the Padres. Like he's gonna get at bats. He's he's more of a 15 team play than a 12 in my eyes. Uh, but if that like if they're facing all righties this week, the Padres, and I can see why you'd want to stream them at least. But uh, I wouldn't get too tied to Profar when he cools down. All righty, Ben. I think we'll wrap it up there. Let's talk about our ad and drops for the week. Let's start with 15 teams. I'll let you go first on 15s, and I'll do my 15s. All right. So we'll do my Olak Olak first. I uh, added Jose Budo in this league. I dropped Bowden Francis, uh, $64, run up of 30. So. Um, I figured it'd be a little bit cheaper than the OLAC, and uh, I overshot a little bit, but I'm glad I got Budo. Um, and then I also added Josh Young. I dropped Max Kepler for 54, run up of three. And uh, I definitely overshot the market on Young. Um, we'll get to that. So th- I that said those two be, ads. That could be a nice one, though, come when he's back. Yeah, so Budo for 64, Young for f- 54. So I was happy with those ads. Um, that OLAC is struggling, so I needed the help. Um, here's main number one. Uh, Ryan Feltner dro- dropped Joe Boyle, $16, no runner-up. Could have gone one, but 16 isn't awful. No. And then for my uh, Jake Berger replacement, I had a Trey Lipscomb for $14, dropped Max Kepler, runner-up of one. So gotcha. overspent by like $27 combined, but it's, it's okay. Um, I needed – I, I didn't need Feltner, but I want to take the fly like we talked about, so I'm happy with that. Um, main event number two, this is, the, <laughs> this is the funny one. So I added Young on, on the second main event. For 114, no runner up, which Ooh. I find I was like a little floored, but um, I don't know. Like, th- yeah, he had a little setback with the wrist with more um, like damage or whatever, but his projected return date is end of May, which isn't that far away. But it's probably because of all the injuries that people were having in this situation on this team. I could afford to take the flyer on him. Um, I had the bid a little bit higher at one point, so I'm glad I lowered it. But I dropped McGill in that league, uh, no runner up, like I said. I also added Feltner in this main event, twelve dollars drop Perez, uh, no backup, and then I added Robbie Grossman, dropping Michael A. Ta- Michael A. Taylor for eight dollars, run up of three, and then in main number three, I added uh, yeah same thing. I-, I overshot so badly this week compared. Well, luckily my bids were lo- were low, but I like no backups. I added Luis Garcia on the Nationals, dropping Joey Ortiz for twenty four dollars, no backup. I added Ryan Feltner again, dropping Bowden Francis sixteen bucks, no backup. And then I kind of looking now at the lineup today, I added Mickey Moniak because they had like four righties to start the week, dropping Michael A. Taylor, $8, no runner up. And I think Moniak's sad today, of course. I, I don't think I even started him in that team, but it's all right. It's only $8. And that's it. Those, those are my four teams. All right. My OLAC added Gavin Sheets. I dropped, this happened in a lot of leagues. I dropped Parker Meadows. Pretty much done with him. Got the day off on Monday. We'll see where that goes. Like I even, I think I tweeted about it. It might bite me in the butt later, but he needs to get his head straight and. He clogging up a clogging up playing time for me. I dropped uh, Parker Miles eighteen to fifteen, so that was a close one there with Gavin Sheets. And then I added Kyle Isbell, dropped Nolan Chenal seven to one. Uh, added Ian Hamilton, dropped Griffin Canning two to zero. Let's just say Ian Hamilton was about the sixth pitcher down on my waterfall on that one. But uh, I, I, I approve that ad. I love Hamilton. I, 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 well, yeah, you're the Yankee. Tell me about Ian Hamilton. Tell me what you got. He's a great guy if you have awful matchups at the back end of your rotation or your, your pitching staff and you need need innings. And he's also a great um, – he's the next guy up, I think, in case something happens to Holmes. God I'm forbid. But, uh, yeah, Hamilton was someone I had – I drafted in two DCs just for that reason. If I need the plug-and-play option, just get four or five strikeouts, hopefully a win, some good ratios. And yeah, like I said earlier with Hoffman, I, I, was, I had a bunch of relievers of Hamilton, Hoffman, those type of like next man up kind of guys just being with as bad as pitching is. I'll take these guys, like you said. If it's a bad week for pitchers, give me this guy for maybe two or three outings and see, see what we can get out of it. And uh, I'm going to do a lot of that this year. Let's hopefully it's not the you know old narrative that you need innings pitched to win because I ain't going to be probably going that approach this season. 
Um, I'll do my main event queue on this one for my other 15 just for fun. I added Yarrow Rodriguez, dropped Griffin Canning 38 to 27. Added Jesse Winker, dropped Chanel because Winker and the Nats have a nice uh, setup this week outside of Glass now on Monday night. Uh, seven to five. So the, I wasn't the only one in on Winker either. So both of those bids were kind of close, which was kind of you know nice to hear. He went uh, further in the 50s in my, in my league since um, Winker did. So I was. Good. I was I was like in your range, and people were definitely were high on Winker this week. That's where it's like Fabian just. I even had one guy in my article go, "Hey, you said it's a Fab preview. Can you give us percentages to use?" And I'm like, "Guys, it's so league totally dependent. Like, yeah. I can. You're. I'm so timid when I've put bids in. I'm not going to help you if you really want someone. That's all I'm going to say. Like, if you really want someone, go get them. A lot of it is like what you're willing to spend, though, too. Like, you, yeah. It, and it takes experience. I've learned in the uh, let alone the NFBC, but the main event, like knowing what type of player goes for what type of range. You know, it's yeah. it's it's hard to like give a okay bid this much on this player type deal. And I I don't even try to do it, but I know if I tried to do it, I I would hate doing it. I, I know I'm wrong. Let's just tell you that much. <laughs> um, let's talk twelves because I know you have at least one OC, maybe two. So uh, what do you got there in twelves? Oh, I just I don't have any uh, NFBC. Oh, I thought you did for some reason. Sorry. No, um, I mean well, I can tell you my uh, my home league after what you're done though. Yeah, let me do my OCs real quick. I had Yariel Rodriguez dropped Erod because he had a setback. Unfortunately, that was thirty six to thirty one. So that made me feel good. Uh, added Josh Smith. I did get him. I dropped Yoan Moncada. I went aggressive on him because I needed a third baseman, like I said. So twenty three to eight. Um, still wasn't like crazy aggressive, but I wanted to make sure I got him. Uh, and then I had a Blake Perkins because he's playing with Yelich still out on Monday. Dropped Josh Bell, who's been atrocious, and in 12 is probably more of a corner infield streamer. Uh, six to zero in that one. OC two got Rodriguez. Dropped Chase Silseth, who's on the IL 36 to 18. Grabbed Gavin Sheets. Dropped Parker Meadows seven to four. So that was not too shabby. And then an OC three got Rodriguez. Dropped Alex Cobb 36 to 22. Added Gavin. This is where OCs. So last one, Gavin Sheets seven to four. Remember, this one, Gavin Sheets dropped Chanel eight to nothing. No backup bid. Um, and then I added Charlie Blackman. Dropped Yohan Moncada seven to two. I love what Blackman's doing while he's healthy. I'll take that all day long and, and run with it. That's one of those like what I mentioned earlier, Ben. About you know, I prefer the thirty percent or lower guys, but I write the other guys because somehow Blackman is sitting there in a twelve. He's like he's there, so I'm definitely going after him. So I got to at least say you guys might want to look around just a little bit because if he's available, um, I know uh, it was the other guy I wrote up wasn't just Blackman. There was another pretty good outfield that I was shocked was sitting out there in like fifty eight percent of leagues still. I'm like, yes, please go check your rosters and go get this guy. Who'd you grab in Yahoo? Because it will be interesting to see as we discuss um, the differences in uh, roster rates there. So I actually it was a light week for me. I didn't really. So what happened was I activated Nick Lodolo off the IL. So I dropped my ADA. And of course, it was like the, they started the same day. Uh, so I lost on my ADA start, but I got the, the uh, Ladola start, which was nice. And then since it's a keeper league with, um, we have, there's a, we have like the NA slot, if you're unfamiliar with that with Yahoo, I added Robert Gasser as a prospect stash. Nice. So uh, um, there, I, I didn't really like the hitters who were available for, for uh, stashing, but um, I figured with Gasser, like the Brewers have Miley starting and Ray and all these guys who shouldn't be starting. So uh, at some point, he, he'll probably be up. Yep, I'm 100% with you on that one. He should be up once, you know, ready to rock and roll. There's no reason not not to do that. Um, all right, let's hit a couple listener questions here real quick for everybody. Um, Yancey Eaton, hi, guys. Should Yoan Mankata been a drop over the weekend in main events? Like, I dropped him in 12s, as it was evident here. Um, what are you thinking in main events? You're more in that world than I am. I, I believe he's supposed to be out like four to six weeks, but I'm leaning towards the six, maybe longer. I'm just, I'm nervous with this whole thing. So according to NFBC, he's actually on the uh, 60 day IL. So, oh, so got, okay, there you go. Answers that question. So it says could return after all-star break. Yeah. So he should have been shot to the moon this weekend. Yeah. So that was a late change because earlier in the week um, it was four to six. I think I even wrote like I'm leaning towards six or longer guys. Like I'm very nervous about you on, yeah, if you truly believe that Luis Robert will be back in six weeks, but Yama will be back after the All-Star break, you haven't been paying attention to the White Sox. <laughs> That's the first thing I found on this, and I'm kind of leaning in that boat. So, yeah, All-Star break for you on easy drop. I'm with you on that one. Easy yeah, drop. Yeah, three to that. six months, yeah. And, like, he's he's just, like, a washed-up potential guy at this point. Like, I had him last year. I dropped him when he got hurt for, like, the 5,000th time. It's just – he's it's it was sad. He was, he was a great prospect, too. 
Oh, great prospect. And then he was actually hitting well this season, not for power, but for like average. He was getting on. He stole a couple bags for the first time in forever. Like mm-hmm. there was like a window where it looked like, okay, we might get something serviceable out of Yoan Moncada. And then pff, there it goes. So that was tons of fun. And then Adam Warner says, Colton Kowser is plus 300 for rookie of the year. Is that free money? I'm kidding, of course, but wow. Yeah, he's got Carter at 300, Kowser at 300, Jackson Holly at 450, White Lankford at 500. Those are your four favorites. Um, Kowser's the leader in the clubhouse right now, but there's a long ways to go. I'll say that much. Um, so, yeah. I would have liked to see what he started out at the, like before this week happened, Kowser, because I'm he definitely wasn't plus 300 then. Oh, I bet you I could make a couple of um, text to some people that I know that actually work for DraftKings and work in the sports book and can tell us that number. And Look at you with your connections. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, we'll call it a connection. It's, it's called years <laughs> of podcasting and helping each other out stuff. Um, he started, they started at the, the ground floor like I did. They just got a better paying gig. Um, so, <laughs> I think that's yeah. a good bet, though. I mean, like, I don't think Holiday's going to win it. No. Um, Carter, I don't think he's doing anything special. How, Langford's kind of been underwhelming. So, I mean, yeah, if you want to bet it, bet it. Yeah, it's not a bad bet. It's plus three hundred. Um, it's one of those that you're sitting, like you said. I wonder what I could have got a little bit, a little bit ago. That could have been fun. He was probably like, well, I think at least like seven hundred or something. Or something. Yeah. Oh, you, you think fifteen hundred? Yeah. Maybe yeah. If, if well, Lankford's five. He's probably like seven or eight. Yeah. To start the season, once he made, it's close to a thousand game. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, we'll see. Long ways to go, folks. It is April fifteenth. It is tax day. As we're recording, we still have about four and a half months to go in this baseball season. So. Long, long ways to go, Ben. What uh, as we wrap up today? Any final thoughts on what's going on in the season? Um, anything else? As the Giants have tied it up at three in the seventh and are getting me very excited. Was Edward in for that uh, comeback? No, he pitched six strong, and the bullpen is blowing up in front of his face. <laughs> oh uh, yeah, um, they blew up a uh, what of so what I had starting for the Marlins too. They blew his win. I was telling Curlin about that, and it was not fun. Um, well, he had ten Ks, Edward, with one walk. Yeah, wow. he looked great. I was like, while we recorded, I was watching. And it was filthy. Like God. he had, he looked really, really good. <laughs> That's what he needed to do for him to be like for him to break out. So hopefully he can keep going. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's it. Um. Yeah. Like Bubba said, like we talked about before, I'm on Sports Ethos. Um. Always love coming on to talk uh, Fab and whatever else you got me talking. And uh, hopefully everything goes well with your teams. And uh, can't wait till next time. Yep. Ben will be a reg- Ben and Curlin are usually my regulars on Mondays. So we'll be kind of rotated around and see where things go. And then I actually will, I'm trying to get back to doing another pod later in the week, at least twice a month, hopefully every week, but we'll see a schedules. I, sh- I will be having your, 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 your friend and uh, colleague Joe Arico on later this week yeah. to talk about some stuff. So we'll be doing all the fun sports, eat those things around here at Bench with Bubba this week. But until next time, Check out Ben on Twitter at BreakingBen underscore T. I'm at BDEntrick. This was Benched with Bubba, episode 666. Catch you all next time.